Amen. Well, let's go to the book of Romans, chapter 14. As we're continuing our, our, our study, and as we started in chapter 12, a couple, uh, three or four weeks ago, of learning into living, we're still in that kind of series of, of, of the rest of this book of taking our learning into living and taking everything that we've learned and putting into practical everyday life. And here in chapter 14 uh, is no different. We, we started in chapter 14 last week, and Lord willing, we'll, we'll get that through today as we begin to just kind of see where, where Paul's going to take us now. One of the things I love about the Apostle Paul in his writing, the Apostle Paul kind of writes like a teacher teaches. In other words, he'll give you information, and then he will come back and repeat himself and give the information again, which is the way teachers like so we can learn. And, 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 and so he's going to do that. And this, the first half of this chapter, he was dealing with us as the, as the professor and telling us how we all have to learn to get along with each other and, and work with the body of Christ and, and, and how important that is to, to not just uh, uh, have our liberties, but to understand that our liberties are never an excuse for us to hurt another believer. And that's what we looked at last week with the law of liberty. And, and so Paul's going to pretty well just kind of go back and with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and going to kind of hit it again uh, for us. And so uh, because I like to do verse by verse, we're going to hit it again too because I would like, if you're like me, sometimes we've got to hear it more than once. You know, I have to hear something over and over again uh, before sometimes I will allow it to go from learning to living. And that's what we want to do. You know, as we think back over just that chapter of 14, in 14.5, we learn that we are to be fully convinced in our mind on these things. Uh, chapter, uh, verse 13, how we're not to be a stumbling block uh, to our brothers and sisters in Christ, but we're to be stepping stones. Uh, we learn in verse 14 that, that there is nothing, there's nothing that's unclean to God. None of the foods or the meats that, remember that time they were dealing with uh, the, the Jewish laws and, and idol worship and those kind of things, and nothing is unclean to God. And, but we're not to destroy our brother and sisters by trying to bring them under something that the Holy Spirit has not even brought to them in conviction and, and being a part of that. We also learn that we're not to let our, 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 our good liberty be spoken of evil. Even though there are things that we're free to do, we don't use it uh, as evil. And then we also learn in verse 17 that the kingdom of God brings peace. And because we're now a part of the kingdom, we're to bring peace. Everywhere we go, we should be doing that. Matter of fact, verse 19 tells us we're to pursue, we're to go after the things of peace. Verse 20, uh, that, that we, we're, you know, that clean food can become evil and hurt a brother if we're using our liberties. And remember, we're talking about secondary issues. We're not talking about foundational things of the cross. Those are, those are non-negotiable. But there are secondary things that the Holy Spirit may convict you on, but not necessarily someone else on. And, and there's not a black and white that says, this is sin, this is not sin in the Scriptures, but the Holy Spirit brings that conviction in each of us. We're not to use that against other people. And then we are to not be, once again, as he will talk about in verse 21, about being a stumbling block again. But we are to have some convictions. Sometimes that's something that's missing in the Christian world today is convictions. And the reason why is because we've gotten a mess-up look between condemnation and conviction. And we think that when con conviction comes, we immediately try to start rebuking the devil for condemnation. And when it's not, it's the Holy Spirit trying to bring conviction. And so we need to learn that difference and understand that we are to have some convictions before God that we're to stand on. And so th this is kind of the heart uh, of, this, of this passage uh, uh, that he talks about. And I love what he says there. If you'll look there in verse 19 with me, in 14 and verse 19. And, and, and I want to give us some areas today, uh, four areas that I believe that will kind of sum up chapter 14 that will help us from our learning uh, to our living. And the first one is about 
as Christians, we should pursue godly relationships. Look what he says, starting in verse 17, going through 19. He says, for the kingdom of God is not eating or drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. I love that. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. This is what the kingdom of God is all about. And so when we're going to be part of God's kingdom, we can begin to look at the things that we're a part of and doing, and we can say, do they bring righteousness, peace, and joy from the Holy Spirit? And if they're not, then we need to back it up and make sure that we are, because that's what the kingdom of God produces. It's not about the the, the laws and the regulations, and this is what he's trying to say. It's not about the eating, what you do eat, what you don't eat, whether you eat kosher, whether you eat meat, whether you eat vegetables. I say, whatever you do, do to the glory of God. Use your conviction of the Holy Spirit, and don't let anybody else try to bring you under that condemnation, but get your own convictions from the Holy Spirit, and then pursue after the things that bring righteousness, peace, and joy. He goes on to say, for he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. If we in the church today would find ourselves doing things, saying things, being a part of things that are acceptable to God and that will be approved by men. And he, and he literally talking about buying, being approved by other believers, being approved. And so, you know, that would be a good thing, not just on Sunday, but even during the week. When, when, we're, when we're on our social media, when we're at work with our coworkers, when, when we're at home, I always say the best place to start anything with righteousness, peace, and joy is in the four walls of our homes. Amen? Our homes need to be a place of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so what a place to start. And if it begins to start at home, then it will affect our jobs. It will affect uh, our neighborhoods. It will affect our churches. And it will affect in every area, even in our social media world uh, today. And so we want to make sure that things that we say and do are acceptable to God and that are approved by men. He says, therefore, because of that, let us Pursue. Have you ever been in pursuit of something? If you're a hunter, you may be in pursuit of the game that you're after. If you if you are athletic and you do sports or you do that, you're you're in pursuit of something. If it's in your personal physical exercise, you have you put goals there that you pursue. You go after, and pursuing is more than just a yeah whatever. Pursuing is something that becomes diligent, becomes something that is important to you to do. This is what he says as far as the church goes with the things of Christ, the things that are going to be of righteousness, peace, and joy of the Holy Spirit, that we pursue, that we go after this with everything that we have, to go after this. Can you imagine if our churches today went after these things, made it a priority, that I'm going to pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. That is what I want to see in the body of Christ. That's what I want to see, not just in new life. I want to see in the body of Christ. Because there's no reason why someone who may be of another denomination or another this, if they're part of the body of Christ, we need to pursue the things that make for peace and the things that will edify others. We want to edify the body of Christ. We want to edify each other. Sometimes Christians will get together that maybe have different beliefs, and which are usually secondary matters, and they'll sit around and argue and fight and lose their, their relationship over a secondary matter that has nothing to do with heaven or hell. And the devil sits back and laughs, and it grieves the Holy Spirit of God Because what he wants to see is that the body of Christ is going to produce peace. They're going to edify each other. They're going to lift up one another. And this is part of learning into living. So in the context, Paul is, of course, he's addressing the need to the Gentile and Jewish believers here uh, that are having a difference of, 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 of what's happening here as far as their, uh, their culture, of, the, uh, of their food that they eat. And, and literally, if you take it between the Gentile and the Jewish believers, it's really learning how the church needs to not be fragmented along racial lines. You know, some people think that, that racial issues just started here in America. 
But folks, racial issues has gone on since way back in the Old Testament. And so it's up to the church to tear down the racial walls. And we do that by showing righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit and pursuing the things that bring peace and that edifies one another. That's how we begin to break that. And this is what he's talking about here, Paul, as he's dealing with those here in, in the church at Rome. And so these Jewish believers, remember, they were clinging to the law of Moses and that's where they, they had come out from. And even though that they, had, they had embraced the gospel, still their mindset was still all about Judaism. And so these Jewish believers clung to that and, and, and wanted everything had to be, you know, the kosher foods and this thing and that thing. And so they're looking at the Gentile people and they're thinking, man, y'all have messed up because you eat everything. Well, the Gentile believers are coming out of paganism. And so they didn't even... They didn't even come from anything religious. It was all paganism in their lives, and they didn't understand why there was all this fuss over all these regulations. And so they're looking at the Jews thinking, y'all are nuts. The Jews looking at Gentiles thinking they're crazy, and and it was causing division, and it wasn't bringing uh, 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 peace, and it wasn't edifying the body of Christ. And so this is what he's having to get them to learn as we started all the way back in Romans chapter 1 of understanding that we all come short of the glory of God, whether Jew or Gentile. No matter who you are, we all come short of the glory of God. Someone had to bridge the gap, and that was someone was Jesus Christ. And as we embrace him together, then we get our oneness of who we are in him, and that begins to tear down the racial lines that the enemy has put in place. And we begin to break that down. And so this is what he's trying to get across to the church and trying to get that done. And now, today we may not be hung up on, on, on those kind of issues, but in church today we do have our little issues that we find. I like to call them people's sacred cows. Go into a church and everybody, I don't care who you are, everybody has their sacred cows. They have their things. You know, that they, that they think, some people even think that some of the things that are, are, are biblical when they're really just man's traditions, and we need to learn the difference between man's traditions and, and, and the things of the Word of God, but we all can have our little sacred cows of things that we like and the things we think that ought to go a certain way. One of the biggest things that happened into the church, and it happened probably about, started probably about 20 years ago. Uh, and that is this thing between what we call traditional worship and contemporary worship. Man, I have seen some churches split over those. Traditional worship, contemporary worship. I've seen churches fight. I have seen churches split. I have seen people want to take it out to the parking lot over traditional worship, contemporary worship, and the facts are that neither one have anything to do with you. We spoke on, we did a series on worship not too long ago. It has nothing to do with us. Our worship is to Him. And so if you do traditional, then you better do it to God and do it to Him. If you're doing contemporary, then you do it to Him. And don't get mad because this is this and this is that. that that's nothing to get hung up over. Now, I will say this. We live in the South, and there's a church on every corner. And so if you don't like the way this church does it, there's others that may do it your way. Now, don't think you're going to go there and it's not going to be an issue. You know, because you're going to get in there and find out that there's people just like there are people here, and you're going to have sacred cows that they don't have, and they're going to have some that you don't have, and so we have to pursue peace. We have to go after it. In other words, we have to look. Don't look for the things that cause division. Look for the things that can pursue peace. Look for the things that can edify each other. If I know that there's a brother or sister that has a, that has a hang up in this area, I'm not going to go to them and go, well, I'm going to just, I'm going to make them mad and, and just try to hammer them into my way of thinking. That's not how God works. Listen, my job is not to change a single person in here. That's Holy Spirit's job. My job is to preach truth as I feel that the Holy Spirit has given me to give and pursue peace 
and edify the body of Christ. And that's what we want to be a part of, and that's what we want to do. But this, man, this thing was traditional. Now, some churches have done this because they, they, they didn't want the fight, and so they decided to compromise, and they'll do one service that's traditional, and then they do one service that's contemporary. Now, you got to do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do, but for me, I think that still brings division because you got the people at this service that don't like them people because they like the new stuff, and then you got the people over here that don't like them because they got the old stuff. And so it still brings division into the body of Christ. You know, and so we have to do the things that pursue God. And remember, when it comes to worship, this is about God and not about us. Listen, I love some of the old traditional hymns. No, I don't sing as much as I used to, but I love some of them. Some of them were so unbiblical, they didn't make any sense, you know. And, 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 but, but that's the way it was. I, I love the newer stuff today, but I can tell you this. There's new stuff out there. It don't make no sense, and it's not, it's not word. And that's why I'm, I'm a stickler here at, at, at North Augusta that Anything that we do up here on this stage that we sing and we worship God with is going to be backed up by the Word of God. If it's not, we're not going to sing it. I don't care how popular it is, how fun it is, how exciting it is, how worshipful you think it is. If it doesn't line up with the Word of God, it's not. And so that's what we're going to pursue. And, and so that, this is the way we want to do the thing. Yes, it's great. It's wonderful. We had, we had some, of our, uh, some of our people the other night, they went over to some, I saw it on Facebook, they went over to some church where they were doing some, some more old-style, you know, gospel stuff and everything. And, and they were having a good time. Yet they're here uh, at, at New Life where we do contemporary stuff. Every once in a while, you know, I like to take my YouTube and turn it on some good old Gaither video stuff on YouTube, and I'll have a shouting good time with Jesus with old stuff, you know? But then I can come here on Sunday and, and, and do a jig with what we're doing here, you know? I, I'm, I'm, I, I tell people I'm blessed because I like all kind of music. I mean, I like it all. Now, some of that twangy country, I had to, I mustered up. But I like all kinds of music. But we can't allow that to not bring peace and not to bring edification in the body of Christ. And so there's all sorts of those little sacred cows that we have to be careful of and, 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 and be aware of. And, and, of course, not only with the worship, even today, law and grace is a big deal. You know, I, I'm very much grace believer, grace stand on, not as a license to do what you want, but understanding that it frees you up to be able now for the Holy Spirit to work in and through you because of His grace. And, I, I, and, I, and I'm not big into those that want to be law keepers, but even with them, I'm going to try to pursue peace and edify them. I'm not going to be a doormat and let them try to bring legalism onto me. I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to love them and I'm going to promote peace, and I'm going to promote edification of the Holy Spirit. And that's been a work because, you know, I, me and legalists kind of like to butt heads sometimes. And so I have to work hard because I always, one of us has got to pursue. If, 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 if a legalist is not pursuing, and if a grace person is not pursuing, then you're going to have division in the body of Christ. Somebody has got to be the more mature. This is what Paul's dealing with here in Romans. He's speaking not to the weaker believers. He's speaking to the mature believers. In other words, he's literally, even though it may be the, the weaker babes that may be causing the issue, he's putting the responsibility on the stronger to show peace and edify. Because somebody's got to be the bigger person. Somebody's got to do that. When it comes to relationship, because we are, folks, you can't do this alone. God did not put in the body of Christ for us to be islands and on our own. He put in us to have fellowship and relationship with each other. It's important that the body of Christ pursue that of relationship. We need godly relationships in our life. We need them. 
We need them. I'm telling you. You, you take someone who, who says, well, you know what? I can be a Christian, and I don't have to go to church. No, you don't have to, but I'm telling you, you're setting yourself up for some failure if you put yourself out there as an island. I saw this little meme uh, on Facebook. It had, it had a bunch of, of uh, zebras all standing around like they're the church, and this one guy going, I don't need the church, and a lion's chasing him. He's all by himself, just running. You know, and the church is looking at him like, you dude, you should have been over here with us. You know, and, and, but, and, so that's what happens. Don't set yourself up for failure. You need godly relationships. And in godly relationships in a church, he's putting together people that come from all different walks of life. We have different backgrounds. We have different temperaments. And so God says, I'm wanting you to pursue peace. It might not be fun. It might not be exciting, but pursue peace. Yeah, but they're rough around the edges. Yeah, but you just might be that one that can smooth them out. But I promise you, you won't if you go in there and try to go at it with them. It's just going to bring more fight, fusses. That's not what the church needs. And so somebody's got to be the bigger person. You want to know whether you're a mature believer? I'll leave it there. All right? You don't have to ask people. You, you'll know. Just, 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 are you, the, are you the one? Pastor Brian always puts it like this. We're either gathering or scattering, scattering. So which are you? Are you one who scatters people and scatters things of God? Or are you one who brings together? Are you one that does this? Because that's what we're to be. We're, we need the godly relationship. And so we're literally to pursue it. Pursue it. So he said, for let us pursue the things. Let us pursue, let us go after that. And pursuing is not accidental. Pursuing is not accidental. I don't accidentally get in shape. I wish. <laughs> I'd love to wake up in the morning and look like Pastor Brian. Woo! You know, <laughs> I wish. If you don't know our lead pastor, you go online, man. The guy's got pythons for arms, you know. I wish it was accidental because I would look just like him. But he, ha- he, he determined that he was going to pursue to work out. He was going to pursue lifting weights. And so as a result, it's made him stronger. It's made him bigger. It's made him able to look like he does in church, you know. I, I bought all kinds of shirts. I'd buy a shirt like his, and it still didn't look the same on me. So pursuing, pursuing is not going to be an accidental thing. Pursuing is something you know what you're doing, you're determined, you're going after it. He says pursue peace, pursue edification, pursue it. And that's something sometimes we have to learn to do. I, I, I'm one of, listen, I like to get my way. I don't know about y'all, but I do. I like to get my way, but it makes it tough when you do too. And we're going two different directions because your way isn't my way. And, and, and so if you're determined to pursue your way without looking at others, and I'm, I'm over here determined to pursue my way without looking at others, then we're going, it, it's not going to work. And so somebody has to be the bigger person. Somebody has to. Somebody has to pursue it. Listen, if you're having a relationship issue with someone, someone's got to be the bigger person to get it right. He said, yeah, but I've tried. All right, try again. I mean, that's what, that's what I'm going to do with people. I, I can get aggravated with people sometimes. I know. I mean, I know. Not none of y'all. It's them other people. But I can, get, I can get aggravated with people, and I'm sure people get aggravated with me. If you don't, you ain't been around me long because, you know, I, I'm bound to have something that can aggravate you. But see, that, that's not, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to begin to try to pursue the peace. And so I'll, I'll go to that door and I'll knock. If they don't answer, I'm going to leave for a, for a short time because I'm not here to make them mad. But I'll come back to the door. It may be a week or two. It may be a month or two. I'll come back and I'm going to keep going and pursuing peace until finally the door opens and they go, hey. Where have you been? I've been here the whole time. You just decided to open the door, but I'm glad you did. You know, and, and begin to do that. And that's what we have to do. We have to do it. We have to do it. Why? Because the body of Christ is that important. Where there's unity, it commands 
the blessing. It commands the blessing. And so we want to pursue it with everything that we have. Uh, matter of fact, it, it, way back when we were in chapter 12, a part of our learning, he told us that we're to pursue hospitality. Things that are going to be hospitable to others. You know, that's what we're to pursue. You know, matter of fact, that word pursue, the Greek word, is the same word that we get the word persecute from. They actually come from the same Greek. Now, I love that because think about how when someone persecutes you, there's something they're going after, aren't they? In that Greek word, or persecute, is the same word that comes in that says now we can pursue. We can pursue the things of God. But they come from the same root uh, of the Greek word. And so, you know, we, 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 with that same determination that a persecutor uses, we're going to use it to pursue. And matter of fact, the Bible tells us to overcome evil with... So while somebody is persecuting, you pursue. That's what he's asking us to do. And it, it, now listen, he's not asking, I've said this over and over again, he's not asking you to be a doormat. He's not asking you to get run over. That's not what he's asking you. It, it, it's kind of like the word, the word meekness. When someone is meek, it doesn't mean they're weak. The word meek means power under control. Mature believers will have power under control under control. If you go, well, I just can't control myself. Well, you need to get the Holy Spirit going in you because the Bible says that with the Holy Spirit comes self-control. And so having a meekness does not mean that you're to be a doormat. It just means that you have power under control, that even though someone may be coming against you and pressuring you, you don't have to give in to that. You can pursue peace and edification with them. You say, how can I do that? It's called the Holy Spirit that's now on the inside of you and me. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We have the Holy Spirit in us. Once again, I'm not asking you to, you know, to go be aggressive in pursuing peace, okay? Sometimes you may have to go and knock, and you may not get an answer, and you may have to come back a month or two later and try again, okay? Don't knock the door down. Just leave a note. I came by. Okay? So don't knock the door down because that's not, that, 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 that's not how you're going to get peace. You might get shot. So we don't want to do that. We want to do that. So we, we want to be those that are just pursuing. This, I'm, I'm, with, what do you say in the Scripture? With, with all that has to do with me, I'm going to promote this. I'm gonna have, I want to have peace. Doesn't mean that it's always going to be able to happen with, with whoever you're dealing with. But you're going to be the stronger. I'm going to be the stronger. We're going to be the bigger in this, and we're going to pursue it. Then God honors that. God honors that. He tells us in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29, Paul says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. That could preach right there. When you go back and deal with chapter 13, when we dealt with those in authority, do not let corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what am I to do then? But what is good for necessary edification. You know, if we would all, and I say all, I put myself in this, if we would, right before we go to open our mouth to say something, if we would ask the Holy Spirit, will this bring edification and lift up, or is this made to tear down? And a lot of times, we wouldn't say things. A lot of times, we wouldn't hit that button. Post. We'd leave that button alone because we would hear from the Holy Spirit to go, I think I need to just not say that. I need to not post that. You know, I mean, some people say, oh, Lord, just if I don't need to say this, and then just let me put my hand on my mouth. Lord, you, you stop me. I wish sometimes that he would do that with us, that he would just stop me, and I lose my voice because I'm about to say something that I shouldn't do. That would be easy. So we have to learn to depend on the Holy Spirit, and we have to learn to yield to the Holy Spirit and pursue those things. So he says, don't let the 
the corrupt word for see out of your mouth, but that which is good and necessary edification. And here's what it says, that it may impart grace to the hearers. He didn't say grace to the believers. He didn't say grace to just church people. He said grace to the hearers. The lost world is listening. They're watching us. Oh, we producing grace out of us into them. See, sometimes the Holy Spirit, I always say, sometimes the Holy Spirit comes and hugs on me, loves on me, pats me on the back, and then sometimes He takes me out and gives me the right foot of Christian fellowship in the rear end and says, get it together, boy. You can't be like that. Yeah, but I have a right. No, you don't have a right. You've been bought with a price. You're not your own anymore. I've freed you up now so that you can be used to me. And we have to get that concept in our life. And so this is what, and as I said a while ago, the best place to start this is at home. Think about your mate. If husbands and wives would pursue the things that make for peace and building up one another, can you imagine the atmosphere that would be changed in many of our homes? Because sometimes at home, you know, we're, we're, we put on our little face here at church. And then when we get home, for a better way to put it, all hell breaks loose. And we start saying things to each other that we would never say in front of people to each other, and we sure wouldn't do it at church. We feel like we have a freedom behind our closed doors to treat our mates differently where we're in private, and we're to still pursue godly relationships even in the marriage covenant, and we are to pursue peace, and that is going to lift up your spouse. You say, yeah, but you don't know how she nags. But then, she, but it, it, and then she says, yeah, but you don't know how arrogant, stuck up, trying to get his way he is all the time, thinks he just comes in here and sits on the couch while I do all the work at home and wondering what I've done. See, it, it goes both ways. But what are we going to do? We're going to pursue peace, and we're going to produce things that are going to edify the body of Christ. If you've got a husband that just seems to be just blind to the things that are going on in your life and it doesn't seem like he listens, begin to pursue peace and begin to speak into your husband things that are going to edify him. Listen, if the only thing he does right is take out the trash, then make that the biggest thing. I mean, when he gets home, cook him his best supper and go, you know why I'm doing this? Because there ain't nobody takes the garbage out like you, baby. <laughs> Woo! There ain't nobody does it like you. There ain't nobody that cuts the grass the way you cut the grass, honey. You think I'm stupid and crazy, but just try it sometime. If you've got a wife you think is just nagging you all the time, man, you begin to come in and go, baby, I don't know what you did. Y'all may not call your wife baby. I don't know. I call mine baby doll, honey, all you know, other things. But anyhow, uh, ooh, it got me off track there for a minute. But anyhow, you come home, and, and man, she's, she's, she's worked in the house, and she's made dinner. And she, you come in the door instead of waiting to, yeah, well, what she's got to say, well, what the ball and change got for me today? You walk in, they go, honey, man, this place looks good, and it smells good, and man, your food is the best. I don't care if it ain't. Your food is the best food there is. They, nobody can make a biscuit like you can, baby. Now, I know that's right. <laughs> but we have to pursue. I have to make an effort because it's easy to go home and find everything that's not like I want it to be. And it's easy for your spouse to do the same. And so we got to pursue it. So when we start at home, then our kids don't get real confused because they think something happens and the aliens have taken our parents when we get to church because they've listened to us in the car on the way to church and then they see something different when they get inside the four walls. And he says, listen, I, uh, pursue it, peace. Let your kids live in a home that is peaceful. I will not live in a home where there's hollering and screaming going on. I just, that, that's not, I, I'm not going to have that in my house. We determined a long time ago with our children, we are, no, 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 we ain't screaming. 
I ain't screaming to tell you what to do. You will do what I tell you to do, or we will take care of the biblical way to do that too. But we ain't going to scream and holler and cuss and fuck. Not going to do that in my house. I've determined that. And, and as the spiritual authority in my house, I have that authority to, to lay that down. This is the way we're going to do it. Now, it, it's gotten tested through the years. You know, as my kids were teenagers, it got tested. Oh, Lord, yes. There was times when I, oh, Tina, help me. <laughs> I'm going to kill this kid. <laughs> you know, hang in there with him. Just love him. I mean, I'm going to love him all right. I'm going to love her all right. But I want our homes to be a place of peace. And then when I get my home, then it will affect the church. And when it affects the church, it will begin to affect our community. When it affects our community, it will begin to affect our nation. It will begin to affect us all. So we have to pursue it. We've got to go after it. We've got to go after it. I'm going to skip down a little bit. Let's go to uh, verse 20. First, we gotta, as, as Christians, we, we got to, we've got to have godly relationships. But also, we should preserve godly priorities. Look what he says starting in verse 20. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Let me put it in our everyday language. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of your secondary issues that are not black and white in Scripture, sin, not sin. Don't, don't, don't do that. We're not going to destroy what God's doing. If someone's working in somebody's life, listen, there'll be things I may see in a weaker brother of Christ. Maybe they, they haven't really grown what they needed to grow, and they've got some hang-ups that I maybe disagree with. I could go to them and hammer on those things I disagree with, and all that's going to do is push them farther away from the things of God. But if I get, begin to go after and pursue the peace, and I begin to edify them, and then I begin to say, I want them to begin to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, And they may not be what I want them to be, and that's not what I'm looking for. I want them to be what God wants them to be, and so I'm going to meet them where they're at. That's what Jesus did. He met, listen, he met a bunch of heathen fishermen and met them where they were and just loved them and just loved them. What if we just loved people instead of just trying to find all the things that are secondary issues that we want to fuss about and fight about, push ways, push babes away. Matter of fact, it, we're not to be a stumbling block. We're to be a stepping stone for the weaker brothers and sisters in Christ. They need to grow. Yes, they need to grow. They have a responsibility. It's not your responsibility. They have a responsibility to allow the Holy Spirit to work in them for them to grow. But I am not to get in the way of their growth. I should not be the one stunting their growth. Because if I do, we'll, we'll find out in a minute the judgment will come on me. Say you're a mature believer. You say, well, I, I, I'm free. I think I, can, I, I think I can go drink wine. I think I can do this. I think I can do that. I think I can smoke cigarettes. I, listen, I'm not here to be your Holy Spirit. That's not my job. But if it's going, if, if you're, all things are pure, all things I'm free to do. Paul said, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. Not all things am I to do. Because If what I do is going to hinder another brother, then I need to zip it 
and quit it. Don't do it. We used the example, I think, last week of the Disney. There are people that have strong convictions about Disney World. They don't think you ought to support it. They don't think you ought to go. They don't think you ought to buy the, the DVDs. They don't think you ought to support Disney in any way. If that is your conviction, then I'm telling you, you better hold to that conviction that the Holy Spirit has given you. But you are not to be put in a stumbling block to a weaker brother or sister and go to them and go, well, I can't believe you got them movies that your kids are watching and blah, 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 blah. And that's what it is. Blah, 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 blah. You can have all the spiritual things, but if you don't have love, it's just clang, bang, 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 bang. And so we got to pursue. If I see there's something as a pastor, if I see there's something that someone's doing in their life that I see is going to bring destruction, I'm going to try to bring in godly, Holy Spirit led conviction by helping them see an area, but it is not my job to grow them not my job to do that. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Some of you need to get that today. I had to get this. It frees you up. You're not the Holy Spirit in somebody else's life. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. I'm free. Frees you up. Amen? This is the work of God. I don't know that what I may be seeing in a babe in Christ that they're doing, maybe they're putting some things on Facebook. That's it, man, they're hurting their testimony. You know, I could go after them and just rip them apart, which is not going to change them. But see, I don't know that the Holy Spirit might be already working on them. And so if I get in the way, then I'm hindering the work of God by trying to be their Holy Spirit. Because I'm, I'm, I believe prayer is powerful. You got wayward children, you can nag them to death and they keep running. Or you can begin to pray over them that the power of the Holy Spirit will invade their life wherever they go. And I'll promise you, he can go a whole lot farther with them than you and I can go. Put me to the test on that one. Watch what he can do. Watch what he can do. This is what he wants to say. We're not to do, don't things, don't make things that, that may be all lawful for you to become an offense because things that we do that yes maybe you've been given the freedom by the holy spirit to do it but if you use it in the wrong way it becomes sin it becomes sin so the work of god is a powerful thing that we need to allow to work uh, in people's lives Number three, look at verse 22. As Christians, yes, we've got to have godly relationships. Yes, we've got to have priorities. But yes, we should also develop godly convictions. I said that at the very beginning. The church needs godly convictions. Verse 22 says, do you have faith? Most of the time we would hear that and we would go, amen, brother, I've got faith. He says, have it to yourself before God. Happy is he. And, and really, a better translation is blessed is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. In other words, don't let your freedom become a stumbling block. Don't let it become something that been free, that you've been approved by God, become disapproved by God because of how you're using that freedom. Freedom is not for us to use what we want. It's to be freed up to be used of the Holy Spirit how He wants that's the freedom that we have. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. People love that verse. And that's usually all the verse I hear. But that's not the end of that verse. Here's what it says. It says that we are to, to listen, this is, this is good. Because what I've got to understand is, is that happens when I'm not walking in the flesh, but those who walk after the Spirit. So where the freedom of the Lord is, there is liberty for those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So the only way you're truly free is when you're walking after the Spirit and not the flesh. Freedom does not give you room for the flesh. Now, we like that, though, because that's what we think it is. Well, they're they going to hear from me. I got an opinion, and the world needs to know it. I mean, I know. I've been there. But we have to stop and go, is this pursuit of peace? Is this pursuit 
uh, of edification? Is this righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit? Is, is this, is this going to be something that's going to keep me approved, or is it going to cause me to be disapproved by God uh, uh, of, of what he wants to do in their life by stopping the work of God by trying to be their Holy Spirit? No, I don't want to do that in any way. So we need to have our own personal conviction. We need to get, get before the Holy Spirit and be fully convinced in your own mind of what God has told you to do. And then you do it. You do it. He tells you not to go to Disney World, then don't go to Disney World. If he tells you to get off social media, get off social media. If he tells you to turn the TV off, turn the TV off. If he tells you to start doing a prayer walk in your neighborhood, do a prayer walk. If he, whatever he tells you to do, you hear from the Holy Spirit, you do. But don't try to put that conviction on other people. It's for you. Why? Because I'm going to pursue peace in the things that are going to edify the body of Christ. And I promise you, if we'll listen to the Holy Spirit, he, 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 will, he, will, he will open it up. Remember, I said a while ago, Paul said, 1 Corinthians, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. I may be, I may be free to do it, but if it's not going to edify, if it's not going to be in pursuit of this, if it's not going to be profitable, then I just need to shut my mouth. Or I need to turn off the phone. Or I need to turn off the computer until I've learned to have self-control of the Holy Spirit on what I should and what I should not say or do. And we all have to do that. I have to do that. I can't do it for you. You can't do it for me. Now, I can pray for you, and you can pray for me. So if I got an area you don't think the pastor's doing it right in, then you just pray for me because God can fix me more than you can fix me because I have stubbornness in me. The more you try to fix me, the more I'm going to push back. But if you'll pray for me, the Holy Spirit has a way of coming through that pushing and kicking, and he'll put it to me, and, and he'll get me right. He will. That's how Tina has lived with me for almost 30 years. Holy Spirit. We've got to get some godly convictions. We need to have convictions. We don't, have, we don't want to have condemnations, but we need convictions of the Holy Spirit in our life. It will save us a lot of hell on earth if we'll get convictions. Promise you. Won't keep you won't 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 kick you out of heaven, but it can sure make this life miserable when you don't have convictions. So get some godly convictions. And then lastly, we should maintain a good conscience. Look what he says in verse 23. But he who doubts is condemned. If he eats, if he does these secondary matters, because he does not eat from faith, and then he says what I've said a while ago. For whatever is not from faith is sin. So you may be given a freedom to do something, but if you're not doing it in faith and with the right motive, then it can be absolutely sin for you, even though you may be approved of God to have done it. May have been a liberty that you've been given, but because we used it wrong, it now became sin for us. See, we're, sometimes we're pointing the finger at somebody else because we think they're in sin, and because we didn't do it with the right heart in faith, in the right motive in faith, then we now both are in the same capsule of sin. We both sinned. And two wrongs don't make a... One wrong, one right, and the Holy Spirit behind right will overcome sin. That's why the Scripture says, it talks about how, uh, 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 how love covers a multitude of sin. That's what it's talking about. It doesn't mean that because I love them, they don't have sin no more. It means if I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing by pursuing peace and I'm edifying them, even though they may have a whole different view of their standards, their life, and everything, if I will do my part in love, then it will begin to cover a multitude of sins. It will begin to bring the Holy Spirit. It allows freedom for the Holy Spirit now to bring conviction on them instead of hearing my condemnation. And so I want to have a good conscience to be able to hold to that and do that in my life. And I want you to have the same in, in your life. And so, I believe Paul took us to school. I believe ta- Paul took us to school in chapter 14. I, I love that he repeated himself, you know, because s- sometimes I have to keep hearing it. Sometimes I may have to go back next week and, and go back to Romans 14 and read it again. 
When I see somebody post something and instead of me wanting to retaliate, I may have to go read Romans 14 again and make sure that what I'm going to do is come pursue peace and it's going to edify the body of Christ. And when I don't, listen, I promise you, the Holy Spirit corrects. He corrects me. He'll correct you. Just get up and go again. Ah, I blew it today. It's okay. It's a new day. His mercies are new every morning. New every morning. So pursue the godly relationship. Be diligent. Pursue godly priorities. Go after those things that are going to promote the things in the, in the things of God. Develop those godly convictions in your life and then maintain that good conscience that he wants for you in my life. Paul said in Acts 24, he says, This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. That prayer I pray over the church today, that, that we ourselves would strive to have a conscience that is without offense toward God, that whatever I'm going to do or say is not going to be an offense to God, but also what I do or say is not going to be an offense to men. That's heavy, isn't it? That's heavy. And so now what happens when we've heard that word as most teachers will do after a lecture, they'll say, clear your desk, except for a pencil and a piece of paper, because it's time for the exam. And so now whatever we've learned and you know, we've been learning, the Holy Spirit says, all right, Stephen, it's time to clear everything out, because it's time to see if you're going to live what you've learned. And I'm responsible for me. And you're responsible for you. And I'm blessed that I'm not responsible for you. And you're blessed that you're not responsible for me. Amen.